to an attorney prior to and during any question. You can't afford one to court appoint one for you. You understand your rights? Your crime spree was over, son. Yeah, you thought you had it licked. But Detective Overton made you sugar turn to shit. <laughs> This episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast may contain descriptions of acts of violence or that are of a sexual nature. It should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. The facts we're retelling you were presented to us by the victims of the crimes, or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My description of the crime scenes are what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. And today, y'all... The name of the episode is going to be called Rapids Burning. And you know that I'm unscripted and raw and all that good stuff, okay? I'm going to tell you how this, I came about to doing this. It's going to have to be episodes, plural, because there's so much to it. But I'm going to, I'm going to explain that first, why I came about, and then I'll give you some history on Rapids, and then we'll get started. So uh, before I get started, I want to ask you to please keep calling your tips on this Barbara Blunt's case after the episode last week I got a lot of great response a lot of great information it's so important share it sharing equals tips okay and we on I want every cold case to be solved and we need your help especially on Barbara Blunt's so y'all please uh, keep doing that stay tuned to the end of the show and I'll talk about Loba a little bit all right so rapids burning uh, Rapids Parish was founded on March 31st in 1807. It was one of 19 parishes which were created by dividing the territory of New Orleans. Rapids Parish was named Rap- for the Rapids in the Red River during the French rule and subsequent seat of government for this area at that time, the post of Rapide. Rapides in the French language is rapid which is already pluralized, blah, 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 etc. Um, the American government took over in 1803 and has remained ever since. The parish seat is Alexandria. Now, y'all in Louisiana, this is for all the listeners who are outside of Louisiana across the world, 120-something countries. We have parishes. We're on the Napoleonic Code of Law. We don't have counties. And um, Rapides Parish uh, is dead center in the state of Louisiana. If Louisiana looks like a, a boot, and if you took a dart and you threw it and landed right in the middle of the state, that's Alexandria and Rapids, Louisiana. So geographically, that's what I'm talking about. We joke in Louisiana and say, you know, Alexandria is kind of the cutoff line for the difference between Cajun and Redneck. <laughs> I think Alexandria has a little bit of both. The, uh, I can't say too much because these Louisiana Parish is kind of directly east of there. But it's, it's in the center, y'all, and the 2010 census, they had 121,000 approximate residents in the parish. So it's not that big, right? And, and I can't call it dying parish, but there's not a lot going on there, I can tell you that, as far as industry and stuff like that. But the river does run through the railroads and all that. So the in 1864, during the height of the Civil War, the Union Army came in and burnt down the whole city of Alexandria, including the courthouse, um, which was later rebuilt and is still standing today, but they burned it down. And I think the name in this episode, Rapids Burning, is kind of a play on words for that. With that, we'll get started. Now, I first came to know 
or be involved in Rapids Parish uh, back when I was with the state police. I had dealings with a detective there, not in a good way, and but that's a story for another day. But they knew who I was, and uh, um, and no love for me, and that's okay. The but a couple years after I retired, or a couple years back, maybe three years ago now, I was reached out to by Courtney Coco's mama um, to look at her daughter's cold case. Now, at the time, I was doing, I had my private consulting business and I was traveling a lot and I told her, I said, you know what? I look at it, I wasn't gonna charge anything. I said, I'll look at it for you. I just slept next time, and I was all the time going through Alexandria, traveling to North Louisiana, et cetera. And I said, next time I come through, you get the case file for me and make me a copy and I'll look at it. and. Um, you know, I'll take it with me and look at it and see what we can do. And, but I told her, I said, you gotta go to the sheriff's office and, and get the copy of the file. I didn't hear anything back from her. About two years go by, and it was last year, uh, uh, Miss Stephanie called me and she said, Mr. Woody, and she's the sweetest lady ever, y'all, and I just love her to death. She's like, you know, family to me now. But she said, Mr. Woody, um, they'd never done anything with Courtney's case, her daughter, Courtney Coco's case. And, you know, I want to know, would you take a look at the case? And I said, you know what? I said, at the time I had real life, real crime, right? And and we were blowing up and everything uh, up for the podcast of the year award and all that. And I said, you know what? I'll do it if you let me do it on the podcast. And she said, come on. And so went over and she told me what happened was the two years before she had gone into the Rapid Sheriff's Office and told them, hey, I want, a ca- I want a copy of the case file. I'm bringing in Woody Overton. He's gonna take a look at the case for me. Oh, shit. They, they promised her everything but the moon then. Oh, no, no, you wanna bring an outsider in? Well, they, I'm not an outsider, they knew who I was. And you don't wanna bring an outsider in. Um, we'll take care of this. We'll do a task force. We'll do this and that, whatever, whatever. So they placate her and you guess what? Rightfully so, right? You want to believe in your public officials. You want to believe that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. You want to believe they're actually doing their damn jobs, trying to work for you, right? And, um, but she told me two years gone by, nothing, nothing. And so I get there and the, one of the first things we did, I mean, she had, still didn't have the case file, but the family had a more complete case file ultimately than when we did get to the law enforcement case file, they had a better case file. But so I had her call the detective who's supposed to be handling it for Rapides Sheriff's Office in Stephanie recorded him. In in Louisiana, it's illegal. It is illegal to record another person's conversation that you're having them with. It's called one party consent. It, that you don't have to tell them. And she recorded him. And this dude got on the phone and said, Oh no, Miss Stephanie, we working it, we working it. Yes indeed. And that's oh yeah, we're working this. Randall Alls is his name. He called us in and he wanted to have like a, a, a power hour, a family power hour. Let, let, me, let me interrupt you. This He's uh-huh. with the sheriff's office? He's with the sheriff's office and, and this, he's, a, he's a detective. This would have been after and uh, um, you had contacted me approximately a year and a half or two years ago uh-huh. about working uh-huh. uh, according yes. to case. So he calls and you in he, after that and tells you this, right? Uh, Yes, right. and I told him Wait. about you. Mm, go ahead. At that time, at that meeting, I told him about you. And he shot that down. Like, you don't know nothing about this man. Got, got to be careful what you tell people. There's people that blah, 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 you know, get involved. And they don't need to, you don't need to be letting out information. And he shot it down. Mm-hmm. And that's why, if you noticed, I kind of just let it. Go. He told me we've got, got new stuff. We're in re interviewing people. He told that's when he came up with this new toxicology report. That's what I was getting, the, that's what I was yes. getting at. It was after you told yes. him about me that he came yes. about it. Y'all go back and listen to the episode, right? But the they saying that they doing all this shit. And then I go to Texas and interview Detective Rabelais. First thing he says is out of his mouth, I said, What the hell are you talking about? This case is over. Two years ago, it's, a, it's an accidental overdose. I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, the two Rapids Paris detectives came through and said they were going to 
get whatever to run something, uh, uh, redo Courtney's autopsy, which is bullshit. And the, he said they called me uh, two weeks later and said it's a it's a uh, overdose. Best guys on it, you know. Like you said, like I know that, and shit, I just can't get away. We got it at least a little bit into the investigation last week, but I can't get away from fucking what Green and them did, man. Well, and I'm not also, bashing it, but shit, I mean, it, 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 I just I can't fathom it. Yeah, you can't get it through your head. It just it just won't go through. Uh, another thing is uh, that we didn't mention about. Two, three months ago, the sheriff's office up there sent two officers down here to Winnie. It was about, it was about two years ago. The two years, yeah. That's yeah, what I'm right. sorry. About two years ago. And they contacted me. I brought them by the place where she was found. Uh, I gave them what information I had. And they said that they were uh, assigned to this case and that they were going to really work it hard and then see if they could, they could get some, you know, get it solved. Well, a few days later... Uh, Detective Isles, I believe his name is, right. called me back and told me that they had rerun or that they ran uh, another toxicology off of Courtney's spleen, not just blood, off of her spleen. And they said that it came back that she was just loaded with uh, with narcotics and that they're closing this case as overdose. And that's just not, I'm sorry, that's not believable. That's not but uh, from the autopsy report that I have, and I have no reason to believe that my pathologist is lying or, or did it wrong, but uh, that, that's just not true. That's not true. Yeah. So I don't know what they're trying to hide. I don't know who they're trying to hide it for. I don't know what's going on over there, but it needs to stop. It needs to stop, and a real investigation needs to be done by somebody who's got the gahunas to step in there and do it and not, not worry about whose toes he steps on. That's right. And, and the, I don't know if I told you this, David. I mean, um, the they went so far as to come back with the new toxicology report. They they took it to a pathologist in Alexandria and had him write up this scathing report uh, about uh, being an overdose and all this stuff. He never saw the body, never saw the body, and he doesn't know the chain of custody on uh, whatever evidence they took in to have tested whether it was blood or spleen. Now, here's the deal. Got a lot of lifers out there that are in the medical field have given me tons of information. One of my favorites from Houston, and they sent me literature on the spleen is the fastest deteriorating organ in the body. It cannot be tested 12 years later unless it's been deep frozen in like that crypto cryo stuff. I mean, but but that's who... I know the Chambers County got money for that. <laughs> and, and, and all the autopsies I saw, the, the, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, a sample of the liver, a sample of the lungs, a sample right. of the heart, a sample of the brain, everything, a small sample of every organ in the body is taken, put in formaldehyde in a, in a small plastic, uh, jar with a, with an airtight lid. Right. And it's stored, uh, and, and, but, you know, if, if the spleen is, uh, <clears throat> If that's the fastest deteriorating organ in the in the body, I mean, good Lord, Irene, it's uh, uh yeah, and, 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 and years, it's, it's had plenty of time, and it's in formaldehyde too. But the 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 other thing is, uh, they told they told the family that it was her blood, and we have it on record of a conversation with Detective Biles. He said it was blood. He even described. Uh, he said that we called down there and they had blood. Uh, and when we got down there and got the blood and test, we're, we're going to get into all that because I'm a, there's got to be a chain of custody. But it, regardless, we and I hadn't told it until today. There is an independent from independent from Alexandria, independent from Chambers County Sheriff's Office, independent from the pathologist that did the autopsy. There is a report that states that alcohol is not the cause of death and can be proven that can be proven medically by the weight of her lungs. And look, they, the, that new toxicology said she had like over uh, four or five times the legal amount. That's why I was going back to earlier when I drank 18 beers. And Bullshit. They lied to this. To, well, well, even if they weren't lying to the detective, mother was lying to the family, to Miss Stephanie on the phone that day, got him on tape doing it. And then of course they passed the buck. Y'all listen to the series. 
And then we go through, and there's so much in the series that I can't tell you now because I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize the investigation. And I'm still not going to. But one, uh, once the arrests are made, and once the case is adjudicated, I'm gonna tell everything. But you got to the point in the case where yes, I turned it back over to, to APD with good intentions and worked with them right up to, to the point where they said they wanted to take it to the grand to the district attorney. And I said, don't, you don't need a district attorney. You got way more than probable cause to make this arrest. You make the arrest. These assholes are gonna flip on each other like pancakes. And on top of that, after you make the arrest, the, all these, they, there's a bunch of witnesses, y'all, in this case now, but you, you're gonna get witnesses that have come out of the woodworks because murderers are behind bars and they feel safe. But no, took it to the DA, that's when I did I burned the bridges and I did the episode and I just laid out suspect one, suspect two. Episode wasn't out 45 minutes and Stephanie called me and asked me to pull it because APD called. Not because I'd done anything wrong, because they neither asked me to crack because there's no way I could have all that information if I hadn't been working with them, right? So I pulled it and, and out of respect for Courtney's mama. And then they, the district attorney, Philip Terrell, brings the family in in the beginning of November tells him absolutely spot on, yes, he's gonna take it to a grand jury, he's going to get a rest and blah, 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 give him a couple of weeks. Boom, a couple of weeks go by. Then December goes by, then January goes by, then February comes up. And now don't think Miss Stephanie's just sitting there uh, twiddling her thumb, she's calling Philip Terrell all through this time, your district attorney, Philip Terrell, y'all for who don't know, Philip Terrell is the district attorney for Rapides Parish. Uh, they're in charge of prosecuting all crimes. The, the DA is not returning her calls. So what do we do? We go, we march, uh, peacefully demonstrated. We didn't tear shit down and blow shit up like they do in everywhere else. We marched. And friends of and Courtney Coco held a peaceful demonstration outside of the Alexandria Courthouse earlier today. The group, which has been fighting for justice for over 15 years, says that they are still waiting for an arrest of Coco's killer. Courtney's mother, Stephanie Belgard, says that she had a meeting with this past November with the district attorney, and she claims he told her that he knew who killed Courtney and would be making an arrest within two weeks. Now, Belgard says that eight weeks have passed and there's still not been an arrest and the family is ready for something to happen. I just want them to know that we are not going away. Um, we will fight till the end for justice for Courtney and that we, we just want whoever did this to her to be behind bars where they belong. So we reached out to the DA's office. District Attorney Philip Terrell says they've met with the family several times and it's been far too long for the family waiting for justice. Here's a joint statement from the DA, Alexandria Police, and the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office. Quote, an arrest has not been made for the killing of Courtney. We have full confidence in the investigation work presently being performed by both RPSO and APD. If and when these law enforcement agencies gather evidence that they believe pr proves beyond a reasonable doubt that a specific person murdered Courtney, then we are fully confident that they'll seek an arrest we're warrant. Everywhere else. But we marched and Anyway, y'all know the rest of it, okay? So the fast forward, oh, I'm gonna tell you what, we got permission from Ms. Stephanie to release that episode on about suspect one and suspect two because of the delays. Now, there have been significant developments in Courtney Coco's case since then, and I keep getting put off, and I can't tell you how I know without damaging the case, so I'm just not gonna do it. But So I asked y'all, I asked you to back off APD in the DA's office because it wasn't going to do any good. They were waiting because, uh, you know, because of COVID or whatever it was at first, and then it was whatever, and then a week goes by, and then another week goes by, and then another week goes by, and then another week goes by, and shit, every Friday I'm pissed off, and every Friday I'm pissed off, and then guess what? If you think I'm pissed, how do you think the family feels? How do you think Courtney's mama feels? And her, her aunts and her and her grandmother, those ladies roll tight, okay? And, and what happens to one happens to all of them. And then you got all these lifers involved now who lifers solve this case. People put their lives in jeopardy to come forward and give information, et cetera. 
Everybody's still waiting on justice for Courtney, right? Every Friday, wearing the pink, rocking it. This Friday, I get a message about another delay in Coco's case. And I can't tell you what it is, but if I told you, you'd probably go down there and ride and burn that fucking courthouse down again. But it pissed me off so bad. But, but I'm, in a, I'm in a jam here, right? The, the, what, what can you do? What can I do? And, I, and I, the, the excuse is so lame. It is such an obvious attempt, not from the person that's handling it, but I can't explain it, but it's such an obvious attempt at a delay for whatever reason. Maybe it's because elections is coming up in November. I don't know. But it just really just, it pissed me off. And I'm not very nice when I get mad. And it takes a whole, whole lot to send me over the edge. And so I have OCD, but, um, but my OCD is not being able to stop thinking about things. And I, that's made me an advantage in my career on solving cases, right? And so I do my best thinking three or four o'clock in the morning, I'm laying there and I was so pissed off. I kept thinking about Courtney and thinking about it. And I said, you know, what, what can I do? What can I do without hurting Courtney's case that can bring some light down on what the hell is going on? You know, we got to do something. Okay, people, you don't have to just take it laying down. I mean, you can always fight another way. And so it hit me. I started thinking about all these cases from day one, when we dropped the first Courtney Coco episode, um, uh, uh, when we interviewed, I think it was Stephanie by phone, and she was crying and everything. From day one, I've been getting messages about cases in Rapids, Parish, murders, rapes, police corruption, DA corruption, from lifers. And I always, it got to the point where it was so overwhelming, the cases coming in, I was like, shit, I was just sending them to my, you know, private message box and I'll look at them when I can, right? Uh, at the time, when they first started flooding in, I was still you know, boots on the ground working Courtney's case. And then time goes by and they're still coming in. And I said, you know what? Fuck it, this story needs to be told. And, and we need to shine the light, or burn it down, uh, tell, somebody needs to put all this together and try to tell the story and paint this picture. If you take just the injustice in Courtney Coco's case, that's bad enough. And but you take it and you add up all the cases that I've been given by lifers, shit, it's a, it's a, it's a whole bunch y'all. And I'm sitting here looking at one of two folders, this one folder and the patron members are watching this on video. It's one of the perks they get, to, uh, uh, for being patron members, they get to watch me record live. And this is Wednesday night. Each one of these pages in this big ass binder is a homicide is a bad case and and um the there's no way i can tell them all now i start thinking i said i gotta tell the story but how can i tell it how can you tell it woody and make it where we we need to get national media attention brought down on rapids okay philip terrell is the king of the fucking one-liners when klb or whoever it is ask him about a case and guy gets out and he's got 160 some counts of child porn and they ask him oh, why did you plead it down to one count or whatever and he says his response is oh i'll have to get with such and such a check on that never hear anything else about it right so how can all this be told we saturday morning when i got up didn't sleep much i put out a post to the life i said you know what i'm pissed i'm tired as shit and i know the wheels of justice turn slowly and if i if i could burn it down you clear the way I want to without hurting Courtney's case than I would, but I can't. I said, but I told the lifers, I said, send me every single case that y'all sent me, send it to me again, everything. And we're gonna compile that bitch and I'm gonna tell a story. And that's what I'm about to do, okay? And the, y'all, the, the, the response has been so overwhelming since last Saturday to today. I said last Saturday, shit, it's Wednesday. So today, I think we added 2,000 uh, new crew members on, on the page. And that's important because when national media comes to look, they can say, oh shit, they got 20 some thousand people here. You know, this, it's a legitimate deal. Plus when we do a call to action, there's every single member we have is another member we can use to bring justice on all of this, on Rapids burn. So 
Now, to tell this story, and I've been thinking about it and thinking about it, to tell it correctly, I, th I think I need to do it in three parts. Now check this out. The, the, obviously, I'm going to talk about every single murder victim that's in this book, okay? Now, I can't get them all done today, there's no way. So it's gonna have to be a series. That, um, but I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna start one today, and then I'll finish it, but whenever, I, maybe I'll finish that, I don't know. I'll finish it when I finish it on the murders, but guess what? No victim in here. If you're a lifer and you sent your family's information, your your loved one, your friends, whoever it was, it's the victim of the crime, of the murder or whatever it was, you sent it, I'm gonna tell the damn story, okay? They're gonna get highlighted. And I bet you some of these people have never had their names spoken out loud since they, since they were buried in the ground, but not by any law enforcement or district attorney, I can promise you that. I'm going to do it. So the, there is not a order of importance on the victim. No one victim is more important than any other, okay? All of them have mamas and daddies and grandparents or had, and some of them had kids or brothers and sisters. Each one of them was a human being, y'all. Hey, this is real life. These are real people. They got killed, murdered, and then later on, I'll get into the rapes and stuff like that. This is serious shit, man. What if it was your people? Look at your significant other next to you and think if, if somebody snatched him up or her up and murdered them brutally and you never got justice for it, ever. That's It's unacceptable, man. And looking at the volume of this, and this is just, I didn't go on Rapid's uh, cold case website and looking for information. This is shit that was sent to me by lifers. So, I know I'm skipping around, bear with me. The, um, how I'm going to present this is, I'm going to go through the victims first, okay? Then, the next major thing will be, I have a file that is bigger than this one, patron members, you can see this, right? We got a file that's still being compiled, bigger than this one on political corruption that are sent in by lifers. I'm talking about cops, I'm talking about district attorneys, I'm talking about judges, I'm talking about every swinging Tom and Dick that ever did something wrong that uh, in Rappi's Paris. Now look, I'm not investigating these. I am going, I am telling a story. I'm relaying information that is, that is told by lifers. And a lot of this is backed up by news articles, et cetera. So, so the second part will be the corruption or alleged corruption, we'll say, all right? Well, I guarantee you, when that shit comes out, people are gonna have some answers to answer for. And the final thing I'm going to do, which is so important, I have an insider who worked for the district attorney's office as an assistant district attorney for numerous years, who I'm going to go in the field and I'm gonna interview him on the last episode of Rapids Burning and he has documents and he has personal first hand knowledge of bad shit. And when you hear who he is, you'll understand. So three parts, victims, acknowledging every one of them. Uh, secondly, addressing your concerns, lifers. I don't give a shit, but I'm not, Certainly, everybody in Rapids is not bad. Certainly, every every judge and ADA and, and cop, that's not what I'm saying, y'all. But I'm saying there's a systemic problem. If you look at the totality of circumstances, there is a systemic problem running in Rapids Parish. I'm gonna burn that bitch down or burn them out. Okay, so y'all know, Again, I don't like to use notes, et cetera, but on this, I have to, because of the sheer volume of it, so you're gonna hear some pages turning. Toby Tom Play, I'm gonna ask that you not edit anything other than make, maybe take out some lip smacks or ums. Do not change a word of what I say, because I mean what I, I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. The first person, first victim I wanna talk about is a name that I came across many times during Courtney's case, and her name, and I hope I don't butcher it, y'all. It's Shamika Lena, L-E-N-E-A Garnett, all right? Now, the body of Shamika Garnett was located near a drainage ditch off of Old Boyce Road. Miss Garnett was 20 years old at the time of her death. She was last seen leaving her home on Friday 
night, August the 13th of 2004 at approximately 11.30 p.m. in a friend's vehicle. The vehicle was later located abandoned at the on-ramp to I-49 at Lee Street in Alexandria. All right, now let me tell you what I know about this. There's a lot more to it, okay? Guess who, and I'm looking at her face right now, guess who was a near and dear friend of Shamika Garnett? Courtney Megan Coco. And the not only did the family tell me this, but y'all this and this is kind of they 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 ran together okay they they were really good friends I'm not, I'm not talking about a casual how you doing in the store type friend I'm talking about running together friends and guess what the she was murdered or she was last seen on August the 13th 2004 Courtney was murdered on October 4th 2004 two girls good friends and if you think I'm bullshitting you about the good friends part let me tell you a little inside piece that I know when Courtney's car was recovered in Texas in Houston and they processed it for evidence one of the items found in the trunk and y'all Courtney's family I sorry, apologize if you haven't heard this again one of the items that was found in the trunk of the car where we know Courtney's body was placed after she was murdered and she was transported in. Underneath her body was Shamika Garnett's obituary, which had been clipped out of the local newspaper. It was in the trunk of the car and it had to be underneath Courtney's body, right? I mean, it, I mean, put that, let that sink in. Where's the answers, y'all, for Shamika? Who's doing something about it? The next one I want to talk about is, I guess it's Teresa, middle name Wren, W-R-E-N, last name Gilcrease, G-I-L-C-R-E-A-S-E. -E. Um, naturally, it's another cold case out of Rapids, all right? Now, this this was sent in the, uh, by a lifer also, and I can't read everything that he put, but I'm gonna read some of it. But this this is a, a clip of an article from the Town Talk, which is like the Alexandria newspaper. It says, it's been 13 years since the body of Teresa Wren Gilcrease was found on the road near Louisiana State University of Alexandria, stabbed at least five times and run over by a vehicle and her family still waits for justice. Gilcrease, who was living in Oregon with her husband, had come to Alexandria for her daughter's high school graduation. An autopsy showed that she died from a combination of her wounds. Her father, Elvin Wren, a Boyce, said he's hopeful that someone eventually will be arrested for his daughter's murder, but he's not expecting it. Not after 13 years, he said. I don't think so. He harbors a lot of anger about the way her case has been handled, he said. He said he last talked to Rapids Parish Sheriff's detectives about a possible suspect of about two years ago. Kind of sound familiar on Coco's case, but he hasn't heard anything new about the case since. Gilcrease's sister, Ginger Jones of Alexandria is more blunt. She believes the suspect interviewed in the year after her sister's murder is responsible and described a strained relationship between her family and some of the investigators. The case remains active, said Lieutenant, Lieutenant Tommy Cornline, the office public affairs officer who released a statement from Sheriff William Earl Hilton, the name you're gonna hear a lot, y'all, in this series, Rapids Burning. Hilton says, we work all cold cases the same way. When we get any new leads, we follow them, said Hilton in his statement. Having been a detective for most of my career, it becomes personal when you can't solve a case, especially a homicide. As a detective, solving cases is what we strive to do each and every day. We hope one day to give the Gilcrease family, the Coco family, and the family of Shamika Garnett, 
in any other cold case we have, the closure they deserve and to put the person in prison for what they did. I'm throwing the bullshit flag on that one. All right. What's been done? And and y'all, William Earl, William Earl uh, is no longer the sheriff that, that in, well, I guess, yeah, would have been passed. The new sheriff would have been sworn in. But this is the, this is the same kind of bullshit line the detective was running on Miss Stephanie when we had him on the phone. Oh, we're working it all the time. Yeah, we've been working it for these past two years. And we told you we were going to work it. You didn't need to bring in anybody, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? Mm, bullshit. You go to Texas, find out they've already ruled it, whatever. I'd love to know what they've ruled. Uh, Tressa Ren Gilcrease's and Shamika's case. Now, the, 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 the bad part of this is, and now, well, let me a little bit. Let's see if I need to read any more of this. Back on the Gilcreases, it says a sketch of the man was released after Gilcrease's body was found and suspects were questioned, but no arrest had been made. Coco case all over again. Gilcrease's case was the first recently to be featured by Crime Stoppers to send blah, 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 whatever. Uh, um, the so they said, we're going to convince somebody somewhere knows something. Yeah, no shit. All right, now, the, one of the lifers that sent this in, he's sending these personal notes, and, and I had this from, like, numerous people. I am not going to say a name because I cannot verify it. Uh, but I'm going to read an excert from this, and, and this, this guy swears it's the truth, and he swears he got it from the horse's mouth, but it is what it is. Teresa Wren Gilcrease, according to the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office, major of detectives at the time of death, the prime suspect was the nephew of Sheriff William Earl Hilton. I'm not going to say his name, y'all. They also said it says he allegedly was a state trooper. Um, I'm trying to edit this out. Uh, under the supervision, his name is blank. He was a state trooper under the supervision of my brother-in-law at the time of the murder. The RPSO major told me personally that in his opinion, any district attorney's office in the nation would have prosecuted him except Rapides. When the major pursued the case, he said from that point on, he was kicked out of the good old boy clique. This is not a rumor. It was told to me by the Major himself, who was my best friend. The Major was a man of honor and integrity, unlike some who think they're above the law. God will tend to all of this one day. Now, I'm gonna leave the rest of this, his statements out. This guy's on it, obviously is pissed off, and he's, he's, tell, he's saying, that his best friend was the, the head of the detectives for the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office, and this case should have been prosecuted, and it wasn't. And he's saying that it was the sheriff's nephew. I don't know that. The, uh, I'm saying what he's saying. So thank you for that information. The I want to talk about another one, and the, yeah, I'm flipping through all these pages because it's so much. This one, uh, this one kind of shit, man. It kind of disturbs me in a way. All right, y'all, the next one I'm going to tell you about is the case of the homicide of Rebecca Ann Miller and Roderick Collins. Their bodies were found badly decomposed off of Sugar House Road in Alexandria, Louisiana on December 20th, 2002. Their bodies had been out there for six weeks. It took three autopsies and an anthropologist to find the cause of death. My mama, and remember y'all, this is sent in by a lifer, Rebecca Miller, was stabbed 67 times so viciously she had indentations on her bones. Rebecca had just gotten out on bail from jail I guess it's October 1. Um, in October, oh no, on October 30th, 31st. This was the last time anyone saw her. Mr. Roger Collins was last seen leaving from the Paragon Casino on November 1 and he didn't show up to work the next day. Mr. Collins' vehicle was found burned 
to the frame a month prior to their bodies being found off of Hudson Boulevard in Alexandra, only like a mile away from my mom and Mr. Rogers' bodies were found. But for some reason, nobody, no one in law enforcement or in this town knows anything about what happened and just forgot about my mom and Mr. Collins. APD, that's Alexandra PD, Police Department. APD won't even acknowledge me or my mom's case, let alone speak with me or my family. My mom's killer could literally be anyone, exclamation mark, and that's crazy. What do you say about that, y'all? I'm gonna tell you some 67 stab wounds that you can count after six weeks Stab wounds that are so hard, basically when they say indentures of the bones, that means they're chipping the bones. 67, in all of my career, I think the highest I ever had on, on one of my best cases was 50, 50 something. 67, and you're stabbing so hard that you're chipping bones, okay? And they found together, vehicles found burned, family can't get anybody. Now this, remember, this is the family telling me this. I don't know anything. I don't know these people. I don't know who they are other than this This lady's a lifer. The This is her mama and poor Mr. Roderick's family. I, I'm sure they may have reached out to us too. I think I actually have another one for him in the back of this book. But that's two more, y'all. You gotta have something. Yeah, I mean, he left the casino. They got cameras at the casino. I know that. She, she just got out of jail for whatever reason. Got out on bail. Uh, probably the same night. I don't know, man. Fuck. Just, I mean, do your job. At least, you know what? I never, not gonna wait, I didn't have one that I didn't saw, but I damn sure if I did, they'd be my best friends because I would never not take their call. Shame on you. Whoever's handling this fucking case, shame on you for not taking this family's calls and, and at least, if you, even if you lie to them like the detective lied to Miss Stephanie, they lie to them. They at least try to placate them. They, they, they do your job. It's fucking ridiculous. All right. Here's another one for you. Check this out. Del Rico L. Anderson. Homicide from 2006. All right. The cold case summary is Del Rico Lamont Anderson was 23, was murdered on March 13, 2006 in an early morning drive-by shooting on Highway 1 just outside of Alexandria, Louisiana. Del Rico was born in Inkster, Michigan and lived in Alexandria about six years. He worked at various restaurants in the area. He is survived by daughter Laisha, his father Benny, eight sisters, seven brothers, he, he's buried at such and such. The crime scene, Del Rico and passengers, Royce Real Taylor, 25 years old, and Christopher Allen Thomas, 19, were returning in his 1982 Oldsmobile Cutlass after a night of clubbing in the Bulls Parish at Secrets and Mansuras and Jackie's Lounge in Marksville. At around 4.30 a.m., a light model silver, silver gray Chevrolet Lumina pulled alongside their vehicle and opened fire at least four times with an AK-47. Taylor and Thomas were not injured. However, Del Rico died en route to the Rapids Regional Medical Center. After speaking with witnesses, investigators believe he may have known the person that fatally shot him. That's it. What the fuck? Who's working a case? Y'all. Del Rico L. Anderson is a human being too. And the all of these lives matter. I hadn't told y'all on races or anything if they were white or black, because that shit doesn't matter to me. But listen to how many brothers and sisters he has. You think that, I mean I guarantee you a lot of them are still alive. And I'm not beginning to touch the tip of the iceberg, people. This is I'm just flipping through hit some that are just jumping out at me. And, you know, I think it's crazy. Why haven't these cases been followed up on? Somebody needs to do something, 
okay? And I've got a bunch more, I've got a bunch more. And I'm, I'm gonna do one more. The, I don't know what the hell's going on in, in Rapid Heats Parish. The, uh, the Del Rico case, whether it's in Alexander PD limits, I don't know, but, but it certainly is within the Sheriff's Office jurisdiction. What's up Rapid Sheriff's Office for Del Rico Lamont Anderson? And if nobody else is gonna ask, I'll ask. Um, now this next one is is a little bit puzzling to me, and I'm gonna end it on this one. It's puzzling to me, okay? And I know this is a more recent case, and it's a young man named Bucky Tarver. Now, Bucky Tarver's not from Rapids Parish, okay? That's the kicker. He's from Mavoyles Parish, which is the next parish over. But check this out. He's not from there. And I talked to his family member for like, I don't know, 45 minutes this weekend. She was a real sweetheart and, um, about what happened. And she told me that, uh, just a bunch of str strange shit. And, and, and if it's true, it's just horrible. The, I'm, I'm not saying July, sweetie. I'm just saying if, it, if your facts are straight, it's horrible and so solvable, right? That but I don't want to do anything to mess up that investigation, so I'll leave it alone. But here's the kicker. The kicker of it is, now get this, of Bulls Parish. It's the next parish over from Rapids. Bucky Tarver went missing. Let me read this to you. He went missing from a Bulls Parish. Okay? He lived in a Bulls Parish. But check this out. The Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office is asking the public to help find a man missing since March the 30th. And y'all, that would have been, um, should I, I guess this year. Yeah, March the 30th. Timothy Clay Bucky Tarver Jr. He's 33 years old. He's last seen in Center Point Colon community around noon on March the 30th. If anyone has seen Tarver or has information about him, call local law enforcement, the Sheriff's Office at 318-473-6700 or Detective Rick Lofton at 318-483-1837. Okay, Bucky's never been found. Word on the streets is that he's cut up and put in crawfish ponds, right? And, and there's a whole bunch more to that and I'm not gonna get into that. But if y'all know something about it, call in. But this is what this is why I'm including Bucky on Rapids Burning. What in the hell is Rapids Parish doing working a Bulls case? He went missing from Bulls. He lived in a Bulls. The by all accounts from what I was told the, the crime occurred in a Bulls. But this family member was told in no uncertain certain terms by this detective from Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office that the detective or deputy, whatever from the Bulls that was handling the case was no longer with the department. And they, the family had any questions, they were to go through him. Why? It's not your parish. Shit, you got Delmico Anderson, you got Courtney Coco, you got Shamika, you got Tr Teresa Gilcrease, you got Everybody else that I mentioned, and, and so, so many more. But certainly I wanted to find Bucky, y'all, somebody, this is still a pretty fresh case, and I certainly hope you can get it. But why is Rapids Parish working at? Thelma doesn't know, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't know people. That I mean, I don't understand how in the hell you can go and, and act with impunity, whether it's in law enforcement or district attorney's office or whatever, and act and lie to people or or Willie Grays would have murdered me when I was at the sheriff's office if I didn't call a victim's family back. Okay? It, I mean, how do you not talk to these people? You just say, fuck it, I'm not taking the calls anymore. They're going to go away. And guess what? It worked for a little while. It worked on Miss Stephanie for a little while on Courtney's case, right? It worked on many, many years. She believed in the system. She believed in that they were going to do what's right. And then Call me in and then it worked. They talked her down again. It worked for two more years. Called it in, did the case. November, it works again. Then it gets to February and shit, here we are. And again, I'm starting this. And one day I promise you to tell you the reason that I got the excuse that I got that Courtney's case 
with now being delayed. And it is the dumbest delay tactic stall thing that I've ever heard. And that's what pissed me off. And that's what's gonna make me now go through and call y'all out on every single homicide case. I'm gonna call you out on every single thing that a lifer sends me. I'm not getting this shit off the internet. Oh, y'all, um, any of the articles I read, if I didn't mention it, it's like the Daily Talk or um, quotes from KALB. I don't even get any kind of copyright bullshit on me. But any the the this was sent in by lifers who are hurting, and it's so many more. It's ridiculous. It's so many more, y'all. It's so many more. But I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna wrap up for today. But I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through more victims next week, and maybe I'll get through them all, right? Because I won't have to tell the whole pre-story and all that. But uh, maybe I can just roll through it. We'll, we'll get through the victims. You better hold on to your horses because sugar is gonna turn to shit. Because then I got a file of of complaints against officials that are from real people who put their name on the shit. Okay, and and it's serious. The, the the and you take those complaints and I mean it's it's just so many that that I don't see there's any way that lifers don't get pissed off. I'm talking about everybody else that doesn't know it already. We don't get pissed off and then we get a plan together and and force some kind of action. We make them do something. And then the last interview, I'm gonna bring in an insider who has the juice is what I used to call it. I'm gonna get a confession and the cases I was going for the juice. He's got this man's got the juice and he's got the 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 reputation and the career to back it up. And so that's gonna be the last episode of Rapids Burning. So if I get Rapids you're on notice, I'm coming. I would be scrambling if I was y'all to try to contact some of these other victims' families before I get to them next week. And then when the news shows up you can be like, oh, oh yeah, certainly we've been talking to them. You know, whatever. I don't understand it but pissed off and I'm not even from there, man. Shit, I'm glad this is not, I, I actually live in two parishes, Livingston and now East Feliciana and, and I'm so damn glad this is not, it's not my backyard and I feel for y'all that live in Rapids. I don't know how the hell you've been putting up with it this long. But I can tell you something, there's a district attorney's election coming and you have the right to vote. So you're right, you have the right for your voices to be heard and uh, Yes, I, I am looking at the patrons, uh, some stuff that's coming up. We are going to bring the media. We are going to bring the power and the numbers on the Lifers crew and all our other social media. When we get done telling a story, we're going to present it in such a way that it has to be a story. That the Jefferson Davis 8 can get all of the, and I worked on that when I was with the state police, but they, that can get all the media. Then why can't all of these victims get media? Hell, you talking about um, Shamika and Coco were killed three weeks apart. And, and, and I think Gilcrease was just shortly uh, after that, or just a couple weeks after that. I mean, this is a time frame. There's a story here. I can't tell it all. I don't know it all. And I don't proclaim to know it all. And I'm certainly not saying everybody's bad, but I'm saying some of you bitches are bad. And Rapid's burning. So, before I close, uh, I y'all, it's just so much more I could say, and we'll get into it next week, and, and we're gonna keep going. That it's just the tip of the iceberg. I want to acknowledge, I'm going to acknowledge each of the victims. Then we're gonna get into the allegations of public corruption uh, or just shitty work. And then we're gonna bring it home with that interview. And then we're going to blow it up. And by then I hope COVID will clear us to come to Alexandria and have a peaceful demonstration and the news media and get these cases the coverage they deserve and maybe the family members and everything, but we'll work on that. But real quick, I wanna talk about LOPA, the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency, y'all. You heard Toby Tom play last week. I couldn't even get in the studio when I was out working Miss Barbara's case. Um, talk about his, his friend's daughter who just died and her organs went and, and uh, they, they got a letter, at least a letter from the I bank or whatever, but hey man, People are dying out there the, 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 and they need organs. And the, it's not like everybody that signs up to be an organ donor's organs get used. It's a very selective process of certain 
a lot of restrictions they have to follow. I mean, it's just so much that goes into it. I don't proclaim to be an expert, but I proclaim to care about it. Be an organ donor lifers. Um, go to LOPA, uh, LOPA.org, and I will put it in the show notes, LOPA.org, and do the one for um, Livingston Parish Literacy and Technology Center criminal justice students, and there's also one now for Real Life Real Crime, how you heard about them. We also thank you for those who donated. We raised $250 this past week for LOPA. Uh, uh, we, y'all saw we sent the, we actually sent it electronically, but we did a check, uh, blacked out the account number to put it on one social media. So you, be a hero, man. Check that box. You don't care what to do uh, with your organ. Shit, you'll be dead, you know? And then, so save a life, be a hero, save a life. And I'm Woody Overton. You host a real life, real crime, the podcast. And until next time or ever, don't let me catch you down on murder by you. Peace. Whatever. I don't know, y'all. I probably went off some tangents. Somebody give me some feedback. The uh, COVID's the biggest fucking excuse. Good night, Stephanie. The, all right, y'all, the, um, I appreciate you tuning in. Thank you for being patron members. Wouldn't happen without y'all. And the, um, I agree, Megan Hester. And thank you, Megan. And we're just getting started. The, yeah, I'm gonna need to grab a beer. Thanks, Michelle. The, um, uh, I gotta do a commercial. Thanks, Ashley Falcon. Thank y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Patron members, it wasn't for y'all. Shit, Randy. I, I got too much to tell. That's the problem. Yeah, the um, the it's so much and, and shit. I know I'm stepping on toes and pissing people off, but I don't care. Now this this story needs to be told. And wait till I bring it home with that last interview. So the I got to read a commercial if y'all want to hang out and laugh. The, uh, which you don't have to hear as patron members. The actually I think I already read this one. So, uh, this video, if you missed it, Beverly, it'll be put up in a few minutes on the um, uh, patron only page. The next episode is going to be next week, guaranteed. The uh, the uh, it, definitely next week. All right, and it's going to be. Uh, I got to talk about the rest of these murder victims. The um, thank you, Lynn Ray. And, um, Next week, I should be able to get more into it, y'all, because I don't have to tell all the preface, right, of, of why I got on the case. And then hopefully, they'll listen to the rest of it. The um, So, I don't know, but thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate y'all tuning in, and thank you for being a patron member. It's absolutely crucial. Y'all share it. I continue to invite people to the crew. We, I'm telling you, I'm working on We're going. We're going to do something, and then they better... They better get their shit straight before we get through this series, I can tell you that. So, all right, I love y'all. Thank you so much, and peace, bye.